Hello, can you hear me? Good. Yeah, thank you for getting up in the morning that early. Usually, I, <laughs> this is my midnight, but um, so I appreciate you coming to listen to this talk, which I prepared um, um, with great uh, difficulty. <clears throat> Until now, indeed, what Kevin said, I was talking in terms of uh, the various nuances and jargons within the causal inference um, community. Today, I want to talk in terms of what this community can say to the rest of science. So I'm going to be a representative of all of you and ask the question, what have we contributed to science from day one? What is really day one? I take day one to be the civil rights um, paper in the 1920s, putting down a causal diagram, which he called the path diagram. And I explain to you why I consider it to be day one, because I am a computer scientist, and computer scientists um, are very sensitive to notation and to languages primarily because we have to teach this stuff to a stupid robot. And if you don't have the right uh, notation, you don't uh, convey the right idea. So <clears throat> my criterion for separating one idea from another is the notation, not the idea itself, but how you express it, what notation and what grammar you use to express it. This is uh, my perception of um, human thought. Human language is a representative and a controller of human thought. Okay, with that philosophical introduction, let's get to what I want to say. I want to talk about eight pillars of uh, causal wisdom. And the reason I chose this title is one to counter I think I have a misspelling of the name Stigler, it should be. <laughs> Steven Stigler, who wrote a very I mean, a famous, not a very popular book now, summarizing a century of statistics. And it's called The Seven Pillars of Statistics Wisdom. And I want to counter it with an idea that if you do not include causality, then statistics is one pillar short of wisdom. And indeed, in Stigler's book, you find about two references to causal um, papers or books in the entire book. And um, the next one, I want to count to counter the recent paper by Angrist and Pischke it advocates a model blind um, method for econometric education, which I think is just undoable. And um, the third is I want to present uh, some ideas for the uh, uh, computer science people who are very enthusiastic about deep learning. And I think what we can offer to this community is some theoretical limitation of what you can do and what you cannot do with machine learning and uh, the various other um, fancy words like big data. And the fourth, and this is the main one, that I would like to empower students, faculty, members of this community with a perception of achievement, with awareness of what this community has accomplished since civil rights 1920. So it's a sort of a progress report of a century of work in, in what? In causal inference. What makes causal inference a special uh, discipline? After all, uh, every field in science is using some cause and effect relationship. Now here I come and I pick up <laughs> those um, elements which has cause and effect in them and I generate a field 
Yes, it's a field from you, if you look at it from a computer science viewpoint, because you use a different grammar, and that makes it you absolutely unique. I'll go over a list of eight pillars of wisdom, which are marked right here. I'll go quickly here and just read them, because I'm going to go back to them and spend some time on each of them. Graphical models for prediction and diagnosis. And this is, by the way, not chronological, and I'm not going to give the names of the people who uh, generated and produced these um, results. But these are results that each one of us can be very, very proud of. That's my point. So prepare yourself to be proud. Uh, control of confounding, a done problem. <laughs> um, predicting effect of policies. I know that some of you will say, no, we haven't gotten to the end of it. Algorithmization of counterfactuals. Mediation analysis and assessment of direct and indirect effect. External validity. It's about um, what, half a century of a collection of threats, which have turned recently into collection of opportunities. Uh, missing data and uh, causal discovery. OK, let's start with what I really want to talk about, which is uh, give you a list of five causal problems, a typical one that each one of us would like to have an answer to, that we have encountered in our research, and they have a unique, a common denominator, they're using common uh, uh, causal grammar. Here they are. How effective is a given treatment in preventing a disease? Was it a new tax break that caused our sales to go up? Or our marketing campaign? Was it the annual, uh, what is the annual health care cost attributed to obesity? It has been in the news recently. Can hiring records prove an employer guilty of sex discrimination? And the last one is on personal decision making. I just quit my job. Will I regret it? And uh, as you see, I marked in yellow the words that s characterize these five questions as causal. Because you couldn't articulate them even two or three decades ago. They were not subject to mathematical uh, formulation. Fisher couldn't even utter them. So uh, it, they were not part of standard science. Science has been very ungenerous to causal reasoning. It simply deprived causal thinking from the benefits of mathematical notation and mathematical machinery, mathematical tool. Science has developed beautiful mathematics for optics, for geometry, even for probability, but not for cause and effect relationship. And that has been corrected. So we should all be proud of that correction. Now we can have formulas for each one of those uh, problems. Okay. And once you have a, a formula, you have the freedom to use all the machinery that mathematics offers us to combine them with data, to see how they relate to each other, to see what uh, con internal constraints the grammar possesses. So it's a gift. It's a gift that was given to science or to humanity, if you want to be really, really uh, philosophical about it. So I will now <coughs> try to convince you, or want to explain to you, why my teacher couldn't even utter the words, mud does not cause rain.
Say it again. Oh, I'm out of sync, right? You are looking to the next. Yeah. Because, okay. Yeah, okay. I should really think with that. Yeah. But this, I have a delay here. Yeah, because this is this is the current and this is next. Okay. You are reading the next. Okay, this is the one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, trying not to embarrass anybody, I say, why my teacher couldn't uh, uh, could not. <laughs> provide a formula for the sentence, mud does not cause rain. But I really mean our teachers, okay? your teacher, your professor, until very, very recently, could not write a formula for the simple fact that mud does not cause rain, or that the rooster crow does not cause the sunrise, or that the reading on the barometer does not cause the incoming storm. Beyond mathematics, and here are a few reasons why this happened. First of all, we have a linguistic mismatch. Okay? Algebraic equations are symmetrical, and here we are talking about asymmetric uh, relationship. A second one, causal thinking was methodological, meticulously purged from statistics, first by Galton and Pearson, Deliberately, explicitly, in Pearson, for instance, Grammar of Science, 1911. Okay. So the education of statistics has been education without causality. I sometimes call it causalophobia. And the grammar produced by civil rights, which was diagrammatic, okay, or a structural equation, okay, was totally misunderstood, unappreciated, undeveloped until the 1980s. Then uh, Arthur Goldberger called it a scandal of uh, neglect. And it got misinterpreted so badly that today's structural equations, even in economics, okay, is a, an embarrassment to any education, any educator. Okay. It's, um, okay. The interpretation is so simple, but I don't find it in any econometric textbook. The interpretation of structural equation is simply a society of listening agents, listening variables, as opposed to, and I say it here to all of you who are supposed to know it and probably know it, and as Ed Limer said in 1985, his experience has been that every econometrician knows what endogenous variables are and what uh, causal effects are and all this, but he hasn't found a, a single econometric textbook that defines it properly. But here's the definition, it's one sentence. It's a society of listening variables. Each variable listens to other, and it's very important to say the word listen because it's asymmetric. If I listen to you, it doesn't mean that you listen to me. Okay? Everything follows from that metaphor, everything. So the difference between the left-hand side, which is a structural kind of equation with equality sign, and the right-hand side, which is a structural equation, is that the left one represents data, and the right one represents reality. And that's why I felt so um, upset when I see universities like Columbia building a whole building on data science and not reality science. Okay. And you should, <laughs> you probably have department in your university dedicated to data science, but what about reality? Namely, and what I really mean is, 
What about the interpretation of data, not the summarization of data? Okay. If I draw, if I start doing history, why not go 10,000 years ago? Something happened 10,000 years ago, which causal really plays part of. 10,000 years ago, human beings accounted for less than one a tenth of one percent of all vertebrate life on planet Earth. Today, that percentage includes, including livestock and pets, is in the neighborhood of 98%. That's from Daniel Dennett's book. And the question is, what happened? When we computer scientists say what happens, what we really mean is, what computational facilities did humans acquire 10,000 years ago that they, have, uh, that they did not possess before? And the answer is partly here at about 70,000 years ago, sapiens from East Africa moved into the Arabian Peninsula, and from there, they quickly overran the entire Eurasian landmark, they wiping out the native population there, Homo erectus in Asia and the Neanderthal in Europe. Okay. And what caused that transition? is conjecture that what the secret of success was the ability to do counterfactual reasoning. And this is a figuring, an ivory figuring, the first that was found that proves that people became able to imagine things that do not exist in the universe, not copy of their prior observations, but new and new objects. Here it is, magnified here. This is called the Lion Man, and it was found uh, in a cave in Germany. It dated 32,000 years ago, and it's the first combination of things that do not combine in, the, in our environment. There isn't such a creature that is half man and half a lion, and he is what put together by an artist to signify an idea. If you take two things which do not exist and you put them together, they may give you some idea. For instance, maybe I want to be as uh, bold as a lion or strong as a lion. And that ability, according to Harari book, Sapiens, accounted for the development of large organization and the development of larger communities and the power that you can achieve by a larger community. So, um, for instance, um, <clears throat> a tribe, one tribe could have promised the other tribe protection on the basis of an unrealizable yet promise that the protection will prevail and it, it generated a market of promises. Okay? I promise you something and you'll get it tomorrow and you got to trust me that I will deliver on my promise. And that market of promising enables a chief to um, organize members of the tribe and do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. And that's unique to human being because, for instance, you could never According to Harari, you could never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey heaven. It's all good. And people go for that. People do go for the promise of bananas, yes. <laughs> so, the, let's see what, we, yeah. When you do it formally and you ask what is special about counterfactual, you come to the realization that we have here a ladder of cognition, a ladder of causation, which I call, up. again, I'm behind, here we are, here's a ladder, see? On the bottom you have the Neanderthal men and owls and snakes that develop a very specific but superb vision system that corresponds to the machine learning today. 
okay? A snake and owls can uh, spot a prey from thousands of miles and perform miracles that we cannot duplicate in any laboratory today. But they cannot invent eyeglasses or telescopes. Okay? You go on the ladder and you find that we acquire the ability to predict what will happen from, uh, by doing things. And that is the second ladder, which I, is called intervention. Right? The top one, where you have Einstein there, and the invention of uh, airplanes and other beautiful uh, technology, okay, involves imagination, of putting things together that have never been before, imagining their combination, and asking questions such as, uh, such as, uh, would Kennedy be alive if Oswald had not killed him? What if I had not smoked for the last two years? A quest for explanation, retrospective thinking, and that's the top of the other. Now, today, theoretically, we can prove that you cannot get, get answers to any questions asked in level I unless you have information from level I or higher. One of, of this simple manifestation of these constraints you find in this uh, slogan, correlation doesn't imply causation, because correlation lies on level one association, and you're asking question about causation, that intervention, and that you cannot do that. You must have some information from level two or higher before you can answer the questions uh, at level two, like what is the effect of policy? I want to demonstrate that in a problem that economists should all be familiar with. And this is the problem of supply and demand, which I'm going to display right here. <coughs> it's taken from Goldberg uh, model of supply and demand. But you have prices, you have demand, and you have income. Income effect, you see the, um, uh, the, the demand, yes? And the price and the wages effect of the price, yeah? So you have here uh, equilibrium between the manufacturers who ask himself, how much should I produce tomorrow? And the consumer, how much should I buy given the price? Okay. And I asked this question to about over 100 economists. That was in the 19, 1998 when I was trying to peddle my book, Causality. And I thought that economists will be very um, interested. So I asked this question, three questions about them. Look, all economists are perfectly <laughs> proficient in estimating the coefficients there, B1 and B2 and D1 from data. It's identifiable. Ed says no. I, I think it is. <laughs> But uh, it is part of the textbooks. So people, you can do IV and all kinds of tricks and identify the coefficients. But my question was not about the coefficients. My question was about what you want to do with that. So I asked, for instance, what is the expected value of the demand, Q, if currently <clears throat> the price is reported to be P0? The next one, intervention. What is the expected value of the demand if the price is set by government or some other agency or by whimsical um, <coughs> decision at the P0? And the third one was counterfactual. Given that the current price is P0, what would the expected value of the demand be, have been, if we were to set the price at P1? Going back in time. Okay. Well, it turns out that I'm, I'm not talking about solving that, but expressing that. Okay. 
it's very hard for even economists to express the question, except of the first one. The first is very easy, bing. It's expected value of u given that you observe a price. Everybody answered that. I then asked that, and no one touched it, except for one professor, Ed Limer, <laughs> who said it's obviously has to do with the uh, intervention. And the third one, no one could write down an expression for that. Not talking about sol solving it. Just a write down an expression. Okay. Well, it has to do with the counterfactual. <clears throat> you currently observe the price at P0, and you're asking a retrospectively what it would have been had the price actually been P1 instead of P, P0. Solving it, also another question, it's all solvable within the linear system. It has a nice solution. No one can handle that. At least it was 1998. Today, I hope that every economist can just run through that and say, of course, I know that I'm over-optimistic. <laughs> OK. Uh, now that we come to this point, we are talking about language, just to express your problem. And you notice that I've used already two languages. So I sneaked in on you two languages. One is the language of the modern, structural equations and diagram. If you want diagram, it's just a fancy way of expressing some abstraction of the structural equation. I have to finish? No. no yeah, ah, you agree with me? I got one agreement here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, two languages. One is a, a diagram of structural equation, and the other one is the language in which we express what we wish to be estimated. Two different species, and look that they look so foreign to each other. <laughs> one of them has arrows or equations. Okay. And the other one, look at it, expected value of counterfactual, subscript, do, crazy. Why am I insisting on bilingual okay. a approach? And this is what I'm going to uh, do on the next slide. Yes, I'm advocating a bilingual approach to causal reasoning. <clears throat> And we need to have a special language for expressing, to specify what we know, and separate it from the language we use to specify what we wish to be estimated. I call that a query. A query is a different species from the, what we know, from the knowledge. Okay? I'll give you an example. Oh, this is the diagram. <clears throat> This is the entire logic, that flow diagram. Right? The red signifies what the user or the researcher needs to specify. Three things without which you cannot proceed. You got to specify your problem. So that is a query right here. You have to tell me what you want to be estimated. You think it's obvious? Read some of the papers that I need to review. Okay. The resource problem is the most neglected part in the paper that I have to review. Okay. And you probably experience the same thing. Okay. The guy can go over pages and pages of what he or she has done, but the research problem is left for the reviewer to insist on. You have to have to specify the knowledge. In the next slide, I'll tell you why we need to have a separate language. Why we cannot use the same language to specify the query and the knowledge. <clears throat> and then you need to have some data. And look, the researcher is not exonerated from the task of doing something with it. You have to specify which data you want to include in your analysis. You want to include experimental studies, or only observational studies, or maybe some uh, experimental on another variable, like you can uh, manipulate uh, IV, for instance, okay? 
So you have to specify what kind of, oh, they call it a fancy name, design. No, just specifying which kind of uh, <clears throat> data is available to you or are available to you, and you can proceed. Good. Now I'm going to uh, add to it one, one more channel here, and this is if you want to test your data, or you want to test your model, then you can combine, you should combine the graph and the data into a box called testability and see the degree of fit. They all do it in structured equation model, rarely done in economics, as far as I could be able to read. And, um, and the question of testability is going to come again and again as one of the virtues of diagram. Okay. Right now, I'm going to give you a little example. For instance, you might want to take observational data, just the probability of x, y, and z. This is your state of knowledge. X causes z, z causes y. Maybe you have some unmeasured variable confounder u, okay? And you specify it in the way that it is stored in your mind. He who asks you or others, okay? to labor and to torture yourself before you can express what you know is doing you harm. So the knowledge is stored qualitatively in your mind in terms of cause-effect relationships. Putting down on paper, that is a specification of graph. If you want to be quantitative more fancy, you'll have a chance. Now, <clears throat> query, user language which is tailored to the uh, policy if you are trying to do uh, intervention, or to counterfactual if you want to do retrospective thinking, but use the proper language to specify. Now, who is going to put them together? What is the relationship between this uh, crazy graph here and the, those fancy expressions which involve counterfactual or intervention. Who makes sure that this listens to that and that listens to that and they do, do not, uh, and they cohere with each other? This is a job of the structural equation models and this is what I'm putting on top. It's not a new kind of uh, invention. It is in, it's embedded in the idea of structural equations except for few details. And the details are not recognized in the field and you, are the, you should be the pioneers in spreading the word. The word is that every structural equation models dictate counterfactuals. Every structural equation models assigns a probability to every conceivable counterfactual sentence, no matter how complex and convoluted. Okay. Once you get that, then you know that, these, that we're not talking about two different foreign languages here. We're talking about two languages that evolve naturally from one simple idea, structural equation models. Fifteen? Oh. I can do so much in 15 minutes, terrific. <laughs> Thank you. And now I am going to justify why I, we need two languages to do what we want. They all evolve from the same idea, the same mathematical abstraction called structural, uh, structural equation models. They evolve from there, but that mathematical object remains in the background. We don't need to specify to its full details. It's enough for us that we are doing that and that. Now, why I'm going to justify why we need a bilingual approach and why we cannot do it in the most powerful one between them, which is a counterfactual approach. Okay? Here is a simple idea. I presented it last year in this conference. Okay? But I don't think it sunk through. Because until today, I hear some people or colleagues telling me, I'm a potential outcome person. As if you, know, you are a different land. 
<laughs> you know, from different <laughs> as if you can do everything with potential outcome. Okay, let's go and try to do it. Bing. Here is a simple story. It's a toy story. Okay? Smoking affects tar accumulation in your lung, and that affects whether or not you're going to get cancer within three years, let's say. Okay? So, plus, you might have some genetic uh, traits, genotypes, that might drive you to nicotine and at the same time put you in a cancer risk. Unobserved. It's a very simple story. I just use 45 seconds to convey to you the story. You understand it? It's English. It's the power of English. Okay. Now we want to formalize it. Okay. And I'm going to present to you two representations of the same story. Okay. Equivalent. One is written in the jargon of potential outcome. And the second one is written in the jargon of graphs. And we are going to judge them not just by aesthetic. We're going to judge them by concrete criteria. Here is the representation of the problem in counterfactual language. Believe me, I've gone through that. Every of this equation is necessary and sufficient. This is how it looks. If you really want to do it in counterfactual and forget about the graph and all this uh, fancy name <laughs> or bad names, you'd <laughs> say, that the uh, potential outcome camp invents. Okay? <clears throat> you cannot do it less. The guy who promised me to think about it was uh, Paul Holland. I gave this. Uh, in a seminar in Berkeley in 1993. He promised me an answer, and he presented it in 1995, a conference. I'm still waiting for the answer. They simply cannot do that. Even the representation. Look at the representation. This is how the world looks in their eyes. In their eyes, I said, many of us, Okay, I'm guilty of saying I'm a potential outcome person. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to ask some question about it. If this is a world in the eyes of the potential outcome camp, what can they do and what cannot they do? Consistent. Can you look at those assumptions okay, and tell me if they are consistent? Perhaps one of them violates the other. It's doable, believe me. There is a mathematical uh, logic that can handle counterfactual. It's elaborate, but can do that. And the answer would be yes, these are consistent. None of them violates the other. Okay. Are they complete? Namely, perhaps we've forgotten to write down one assumption, which is part of the story. I gave you a story, you understood it. Have I forgotten any assumptions there just to replicate and to convey the story? It's hard to tell from this syntax. Okay. Are they redundant? Perhaps one of them follows from the other. Okay. Hard to tell. Doable. There is a, there is a logic for that. Okay. Are they plausible? Which means, do they match the story? The story is plausible. But if, if you just look at that, can you tell whether all these assumptions are plausible, whether they relate and they're compatible with your experience or with your knowledge about cancer and smoking? It's hard. Are they testable? Well, this is very concrete, right? Is there any statistical method in which to violate them? Or is, is there statistical data could ever violate those assumptions? All these are questions that are very hard to answer in this representation. Now look at the alternative. Oh no, no before we go to alternative, this is okay, this is an alternative, yeah, of the structural equation. You draw down the story the way I told you. Who affects whom? Where you have a confounder. It's right there. This is a specification. 
which summarizes, which is exactly equal to that. Exactly. No, I can write those <coughs> um, sentences in counterfactuals. I can write it straight from the graph. There is a mapping to that, and vice versa. You give me those, I can draw the graph. But it's not only a matter of uh, <coughs> convenience. It's not a matter of convenience, because certain things are quantitatively less complex in one representation than another. In computer science, we know that the representation is a key to complexity. Things which are polynomial time in one representation become exponential in another one, even though there are one to, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. This is what it represents in terms of the uh, oracle, which I call structural equation models, which you don't have to specify. It's implicit. I feel it's the introduction. No, no, no. I'm, now we go to the <laughs> pillars of wisdom. Okay. <clears throat> now, after working for this area for maybe 20 years, one owes to society a progress report, right? So here is my progress report. It's not only my doing, but it's a doing of the entire community, and I'm, I didn't put names there, but here they are. This is what was produced with what? Just a simple idea that the syntax of cause-effect relationship deserves special attention. It's a different kind of syntax. It's a different kind of thinking. It deserves a language. It deserves behind the language. It deserves semantics, and behind that it deserves. And then it deserves mathematical machinery to derive things, which did not exist before civil right put down an arrow. Did not exist. A slide for each. How much time do I have? Five. Do you? One minute per pillar. <laughs> yes. Some uh, summary. <coughs> there was a development called Bayesian Network in computer science in the time that we were looking for expert system to replicate doctors and lawyers to, uh, by machine. And it turns out that the graphical model called Bayesian Network um, had to do, uh, performed quite well in this task. You have a network there which <clears throat> enables you to uh, update evidence, update beliefs on the basis of evidence quickly, swiftly, reliably, and using message passing uh, scheme. And I consider that to be the gift of God. That probability theory found a way to represent itself in graph. It's a gift of graph because uh, a gift of God, because whoever expected you know, <clears throat> the axioms of conditional independence to share a large core with the axioms of graph interception. And they do, they do. The interception in graph has four or five axioms, okay, and they happen to coincide with David's uh, axioms of conditional uh, independency. That was a gift of God, because that enables us to do a disseparation, which is the reflection of the data, of the, <coughs> of the causal the, the, the causal model behind reality okay, in our data <clears throat> enables you to look at the graph and decide um, which, which nodes are conditional independent given others. Okay. Pillar two deserve a minute. The menace of confounding is now deconfounded. And I'll defend this statement. I know it's a sweeping statement, but I'll defend it. Okay? This menace has been around since um, 
Pearson discovered spurious correlation. And he said anybody that that's a proof that causation correlation is not causation. It was rediscovered by Yule and by Simpson. Okay? It has been a topic of discussion in epidemiology from the day that epidemiologists looked in, in the data. Okay. I'm saying it's totally deconfounded now. It's a very, we have a solution. We can, and the proof is that we can decide, looking at the graph, what covariance needs to be controlled for if we want to eliminate confounding, if you want to do, <clears throat> um, if you want to eliminate the bias due to confounders. Okay. It's, uh, or if you do matching, if you want to do a propensity score, all these methods are just uh, names for procedures that people have adapted in order to fight confounding. Okay. But one thing remains a puzzle, what covariance should they adjust for? Well, this is given to you by backdoor admissibility, which is a graph representation of what the um, potential outcome people's strong ignorability. Or a question that economists ask themselves um, on a daily basis, which coefficients are identified by OLS? Here's my structural equation. Oh, the model contains 47 variables and a, a mishmash of uh, arrows going all the way around. Which of the coefficients there is identified by OLS? It has a very simple answer. Look at the graph and decide. I know that none of you teaches that. But I want you to know what you're missing. It's very important for me to have you realize it. Okay, um, the next uh, pillar should be going beyond adjustment. <clears throat> it asks a question in general, when can the effect of intervention be estimated without physically intervening by an analytical method, any analytical method? So going beyond adjustment. And the answer is, well, a game called do calculus tells you that your policy expression involving do's operators can be reduced to a do-free expression. It's a logic. If you apply the rule, you change the expressions. And if you succeed in eliminating the do, what you have? You have only C. And what is C? C is basing it on observational studies. That's exactly what we mean by identification. Done, complete, rest. And it can be done in polynomial time. Pillar four. The algorithmization of counterfactuals, I touched on that already. Counterfactuals are not the product of a whimsical mind, no relationship between treatment and outcome, but a feature of physical re uh, reality, as represented by structural equation. And that's what I meant, the, every structural equation model assigns a probability to every counterfactual sentence. Therefore, if people share a model of the world, they should also agree on all counterfactuals which explain why we agree on the statement that if Oswald did not kill Kennedy, then somebody else did. Or, and, we, and if we don't agree on the sentence, if, <clears throat> if Oswald were not to uh, kill Kennedy, somebody else would have. We agree on the first and not the second one, and we form a consensus. How can you explain that we form a consensus on something as fanciful as the politics or the sentiments in uh, Dallas, Texas. Okay. <clears throat> well, that explains it. Because we share a perception of what causes what in the world, and that dictates our agreement on counterfactuals. Examples are effect of treatment on a treated. These are counterfactuals 
um, tasks that are constantly being analyzed in the literature. Necessary and sufficient causes of effect, and so on. The next one, mediation analysis. A nice pillow. Everybody wants to understand the mechanism by which causes transmitted its change onto the effect. And counterfactual logic must be invoked if you want to find things like indirect effect. And the graphical representation enables us to decide when direct and indirect effects are estimable from observational or experimental data or combination thereof. And also it's polynomial time. External validity and selection bias, and Elias is going to elaborate on that on Tuesday. I would just have to say that um, I believe uh, Deaton is also going to talk about it today. Uh, it, what we are seeking is guarantees that what works here would also work elsewhere. Very simple requirement. And since Campbell and Stanley I coined the word external validity <clears throat> in 1963, it should be. The field has accumulated a um, list of uh, threats to that requirement, threats upon threats, and the list is in increasing with the imagination of people who try to solve this problem. Okay? But I haven't seen any mechanism for disarming those threats. And finally, with the work of Elias, we have today a um, solid theory that tells you when you can disarm threat one or threat two, whether you have enough knowledge to do that, whether you need additional kind of data okay, that you should collect if you really want to solve the problem. It's all formulized mathematically. So I'm very happy with pillar six, and I'm going to pillar seven, and I'm going to end up so soon. Missing data, which Kartika is going to talk to us on Tuesday. That's another area which we used to think it's a, totally within the province of statistics. A statistical problem? No, it isn't. It's a causal problem. And now that we understand the different grammars, we can tell whether it belongs in one area or another. The idea is that you cannot do missing data without assumptions about the reasons for the missingness. Reasons for missingness means causal modeling. And if you model it causally and you use all the machinery that has accumulated in this community about dealing with cause effect, then you can answer a beautiful question about it. Can you recover the missing data? Do you have a consistent estimate? And the question of whether a consistent estimate exists or doesn't exist has not been asked before, even by people, the statistical community, because they couldn't solve it. It's, it's a quality of science. You don't ask a question that you cannot solve. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Last pillar which I'm not going to elaborate on. I, I hope Clark uh, Glimo will tell us more about it. <clears throat> it's a way of uh, recovering or discovering the causal graph behind the data. It's built on mild assumptions that I'm not going to elaborate here. I'm running off, over my time. I would like, however, not to finish before I re-quote and re-quote again the uh, statement by <coughs> Gary King, which says that Moore has learned about causal influence in the last few decades than the sum total of everything that had been learned about it in all of prior recorded history. Very sweeping statement. That's why I quote it again and again. <laughs> and I will finish with Democritus, <coughs> who invited me to be the king of Persia, a job that I'm not sure uh, would be 
<laughs> my wife would like me to take, <laughs> okay? But I still would like to discover one causal relation. Okay, so thank you very much for being so attentive, and credit goes to the teams and many more. This was not my only work. Many people participated and contributed ideas. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions, of course. Catch me day and night. <laughs>